How many of you said McDonald's? How many of you said 7-Eleven? How many of you said Zippies? L&L, of course. All right. Well, you'll see how this all fits in my sermon somehow. So, the theme. What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? If you're going through a hard time right now, this sermon is for you. You're in the right place. If you're strong right now and you're willing to help someone else, this sermon is for you. If you need forgiveness or need to forgive someone, then um, God has something for you today. And what we will learn today, may it last in our hearts and souls forever. You know what, I'm gonna move this music stand because I can't see the people on this side. Okay, super. So, at this point, uh, please stand in honor of God's word as I read from Psalm 130, just the first five verses, and hear the desperate emotion and the pathos of the writer. So from verse one in Psalm 130, it says this, out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive for my cry for mercy. And if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that we can, with reverence, serve you. I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits, and in his hope, I, in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning, more than watchmen wait for the morning. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. Now, these five verses are just packed with meaning. And if you're feeling today like you're in a, the depths of a whirlpool, these five verses can be like rungs of a ladder, not only giving you a way out of drowning, but also truths that are profound and practical. As your pastor, I know how hard life is. I have a friend who two months ago lost her mom. And then a couple of weeks ago, she lost her husband. And while ministering to her husband in his final months, her doctor told her that she has cancer. But she had to delay surgery and treatment because she was taking care of her husband. And for the average person, this is way too much. And I'll be doing the memorial service for her husband soon. Life can seem like it's just piling on doesn't it? In the very first verse of the psalm, you feel the writer is desperate. Out of the depths I cry to you, Lord. Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to my cry for mercy. And we get the sense that this writer is drowning from maybe a traumatic event or a long-time season of suffering or perhaps a moral failure that has left this person in deep, smelly kimchi. Have you ever felt that? Something hits you out of nowhere and you are basically asking, God, where are you? Can you hear my voice? Can you hear my cries? And so desperate is this person. He writes in verse five, I wait for the Lord. My whole being waits. And in his word, I put my hope. I wait for the Lord more than watchmen wait for the morning. More than watchmen wait for the morning. Notice he writes that last line twice for emphasis. Like military watchmen pacing back and forth. I'm looking for you, Lord. A watchman waiting for the morning when things don't seem so dark, when his surroundings might seem more safe. And maybe the shift is soon to be over. And the watchman is just so tired of waiting and watching and waiting and watching. And he waits for the morning out of the darkness. And we talk about seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, meaning hope. But as we wait, we don't know if the light is an exit or it's a train coming right at us. This verse says, wait for the Lord, my whole being waits. So I want to drill down on this phrase we hear so often, we must wait upon the Lord. What does that mean, wait upon the Lord? It's like, is it like a, a waiter, you know, who waits upon a guest? Uh, Scott Schultz says, if like a waiter you wait upon the Lord, you will get good tips. 
Scott, I told you it was a bad joke. You ought to hear them sighing right now. Um, and I know you're watching online, so you got to know it, it didn't work. <laughs> now, this means one of the greatest things we can do and have to do when there is utmost pain in our lives is to wait. Just wait for the Lord to act, to speak, and knowing that the king always has one more move. And when that medical report comes back, that is not good news. We sometimes have to just wait for the next step. When finances are tough, we often have to just wait. When we're going through physical pain and it doesn't disappear immediately, we have to wait. Not just wait, but wait for the Lord to respond in a way that we might understand. God's response might be orders for the next direction. Or it might mean to just be patient until he acts or circumstances change. Just wait. Over and over again, you hear this phrase in the Bible, wait for the Lord. I mean, here are some sample verses throughout the Bible. In Psalm 27, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. Psalm 33, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 37, be still before the Lord and wait patiently for him. Do not fret when people succeed in their ways, when they carry out their wicked sins schemes. Psalm 40, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. And saw uh, Isaiah 30, yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. Therefore, he will rise up to show you compassion for the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. I should have called this sermon in pidgin English, try wait, try wait, try wait. <laughs> to be clear, Waiting for most of us is not our strongest suit. And society doesn't help us. We're used to things being microwaved. Our food can be heated or cooked quickly, right? We can get Zippy's chili and we throw it in a boiling pot of water and it is soon ready. We can get packaged or a cup of raw men and we add some hot water and boom, it's quickly ready. We can drop uh, by a multitude of fast food places that you mentioned and get food quickly. In a recent Honolulu Magazine article, uh, there's an article rating the top seven foods at 7-Eleven. So now fast foods is going Michelin on us. We're gonna have stars. I have to say though, at 7-Eleven, I think the Spam Musubi is like way up there. And great maki sushi, which I had for breakfast to get ready for you today. You know, this whole thing about speed, I mean, washing our clothes in the old days, right, meant um, um, hours of taking the clothes to the river and scrubbing them, maybe using a washboard, beating it, and then hanging them up, right? Now, when we say, oh, I gotta wash a load of clothes, it means pushing a button. I'm washing, look, I'm washing. And um, in the old days, we would hang up our clothes to dry. Many of you still do it that way. But many of us, like, just push a button. Look, I'm drying my clothes. And it's fast. And using our microwave ovens means just pushing a button, right? Look, I'm cooking. But when we suffer and there is pain or conflict in our lives, we can be frustrated because there are no quick or immediate or easy answers, and then we can think we got a raw deal in this life. Where's the button to push? I mean, we become button people, right? We don't even walk stairs up to get exercise. We hit the button, and boom, we're there on the fifth floor, tenth floor. And we say, Lord, I want immediate pain relief, immediate wisdom of what job to take, what apartment to rent. And if you don't give it immediately, then something's wrong with you, Lord, not me. And it's hard for us in modern times, but it was hard thousands of years ago too, as a psalmist writes, that his soul waits for the Lord more than watchmen for the morning. So I have just three basic things to share with you all, especially for those of you who are in pain and for those of you who want to help someone in pain. Point number one, waiting is active, not just sitting around and doing nothing. While we are waiting for the Lord, it doesn't mean that we're being a couch potato in faith. 
Like here I am just sitting in my rocker, you know, drinking my country club iced tea, waiting for the Lord to tell me what to do. Charles Swindoll said the, um, says the word wait in Hebrew, which these Bible verses were written in, is a Hebrew word kawa, which means to twist or to stretch. And the noun um, form means a, a line or a a cord or a, th a strong thread. The literal definition uh, demonstrates there's just tension or eager anticipation, like you've got a line to God waiting for his response. And rather than just moping and complaining, uh, we need to be active and ask ourselves, what might God be doing in this circumstance right now? Is he teaching something to me? Is he building a, like a faith muscle? Is he teaching me a truth that I don't yet have in my heart? It might mean to get going and to talk to more people to get godly counsel. It, it might mean to pray more or ask more people to pray for you. It might mean to research more. It might mean to seek medical advice or therapeutic help and get second opinions. It might mean to search the scriptures for, for advice. It might mean an opportunity to grow in your relationship with God. Waiting for the Lord means to be active in the wait and not sleep through it and just say, woe is me, woe is me. But what if your issue is that someone wronged you or betrayed you, hurt you in some way? What does it mean to wait upon the Lord? Remember in the passage that I read this morning, it said in verse 3, if you, Lord, kept a record of sins, Lord, who could stand? But with you, there is forgiveness so that, so that we can, with reverence, serve you. The writer earlier had asked for mercy, but notice how the psalmist is saying that with God there is forgiveness so that, so that we can serve God. Interesting. We can be forgiven so that we can get back in the saddle and serve God again. But when we have been sinned against, and maybe we were waiting for justice, but there was not any justice of how we wanted it to be, then how can we forgive and in doing so serve God? How can we model his forgiveness and unfailing love for all? I believe the Bible defines forgiveness not as I forgive and forget because we never forget injustice is done to us, but rather forgiveness means we can give up the right to retaliate for only God knows how to fairly retaliate. It can mean we can still Pray for the best for someone who has harmed us. I know it's tough when Jesus says, love your enemies and pray for them. Like, how does that work? Sounds impossible, but maybe possible when we wait upon the Lord and ask him, what should I really do according to my faith that my sins, my sins have been forgiven? And so what else should I do about someone else's sins? Now, here's a real life story. Do you remember back in October 2006 um, in Pennsylvania, uh, a horrible thing happened. A gunman went into a one-room West Nichols Mine School of the Amish community in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, and he shot eight of ten girls he trapped there, young ages, six to thirteen. Five died, and then he killed himself. Imagine being part of that community or being a parent of that child who got killed and the murderer doesn't get any justice in terms of a prison sentence. He did his evil and then took himself out. For most of us waiting for the Lord, we might think it would mean to sit and wait for the comfort for me and love from, from God, uh, to sit and wait for encouragement for other people, where every molecule of our body and cell of our soul might cry out that our need for love. And I would be devastated if that happened to my family or my community. But extraordinarily, if you can believe this, within hours of the suicide killing, members of the Amish community visited 
the murderer's parents. And they went to express their forgiveness to them and sympathy, sympathy for their loss of their son. Incredible. It was reported that one Amish man held, held the father of the killer in his arms as long as an hour to comfort him. The Amish even set up a fund for the family of the shooter and asked them, please don't leave our community. When the gunman was buried a few days later, his widow and her children were stunned to see 30 Amish attended to show their support and care for the, murdered, uh, the murderer's family. When one waits upon the Lord to know how to act in His way, even in the most desperate tragic times, the secular world often doesn't know how to handle that, that we forgive so that we can serve God. When a made-for-TV movie was broadcast about this um, incident, the producers created a fictional character of an Amish mother of one of the murdered children. But they made that character as one who was filled with doubts and angry at God and unable to, to have any forgiveness. In fact, in the movie, she almost abandons her faith. In hearing about the movie, the Amish community protested for no one in their community did not forgive. No one lost their faith. And the secular filmmakers could not understand how that was possible, so they needed to create a character with a natural reaction to evil done to her. They didn't understand that it's possible to supernaturally forgive those who have wronged us if we wait upon the Lord. He is able to give the most grieved the strength to act out the same forgiveness that the Lord shows you and me on a daily basis. And the mother of the murderer was so moved by the Amish parents. Um, she, said, uh, she, she said, and I quote her, um, ask God to provide new things for you in your lives, new things to focus on, that doesn't take the place of what is lost, but it can give us a hope and future. Somehow that woman who was not part of the Amish community was moved to understand more about God in this way, even though she lost children. As an early challenge question for you in this message, is there someone who has done you harm that you need to forgive? Is there someone you need to wait upon the Lord to forgive? And for some of us, I know it's complex, is that someone who needs to be forgiven you? Is it you who needs to accept the forgiveness of God? As Christians, we believe that if there's to be any penalty or payback, it will be the Lord who does that for us and not us doing the payback. For we as sinful humans do not know what a fair punishment would be, right? You come out with me with a knife, I'll come out with you with a gun. You come out with a gun, I'll come with a bazooka. You come with a bazooka, I'll come with a tank. We would always do much more than what would be just when we go after somebody. The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, do not say, I'll pay you back for this wrong. Wait for the Lord and he will avenge you. Oh, there's that phrase again, wait for the Lord. What does that mean? So we're starting the journey to unpack that. Point one, as I said, waiting is active, not just sitting around and doing nothing. And the Amish were actively waiting while still in the midst of their own pain and suffering and struggles and wondering where was God in this? I'm sure they were active in discussing how should we respond to this tragedy. And now point two, waiting is asking, what is God doing right now in our midst? Waiting is humbling. It is really humbling to wait for the Lord. Humbling because when we, have, when we suffer or have setbacks, we realize we don't have the power to prevent evil or betrayal or financial setbacks or when our health goes awry. It is humbling because we realize in waiting, 
we are not God. We are not all powerful. We're not all wise. Only God is. And in true hum humility, we should come to the realization that we are not as strong as we think. We're not as smart as we think. We're not as wise as we think. We're not as calm as we think. Not as just and, and fair as we think. And when bad times hit, rather than cry, poor me, poor me, ask, what is God doing right now in my life? Is he trying to say something to me? Is he teaching me something? Is he moving the puzzle pieces around in his divine plan? Or as the Hawaiians have that checkerboard-like game, uh, Konane, what pieces is he moving in the game? Pa Pastor Rick Warren said that oftentimes God is seeing how and when you will trust him as you're waiting. When we're in pain, it's a good time for us to ask ourselves some important questions. How well do I really know God? Another question. How faithful, oh, I should say, how well does God know me? And then you think, how faithful is God to not let me down versus how faithful am I in not letting him down or leaving him? The fact is, there are, are a lot of things to be worried about. And there's a lot of troubles in life. You know who said that? Jesus said that. In the Gospel of Matthew, Jesus flat out said, don't worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will bring worries of its own. And today's trouble is enough for today. So great, he is saying you'll have worries today, and guess what? Tomorrow you're going to have more worries. So don't worry about tomorrow, because you have enough real troubles today. He is saying... Troubles are going to keep on coming, so don't think it's unusual when you go through tough times. My wise mentor, Larry Langdon, who was an executive with uh, Hewlett Packard and other places, Ford Motor Company, he taught me in my previous church that when a crisis hits, I have to manage, take care of it right then because there will be more crises coming in the future. He said, don't let them pile up. You've got a trouble today that's a crisis. Guess what? Tomorrow you may have four crises, so take care of it today. But then, of course, Jesus was also saying, if you would just trust me, you would know that when the crisis comes, I am saying to you, if you can hear me, he's saying, I, I got this. I got you. And I really, really love you. So no worry, no worry about all of life's intricacies and the snowballing of crisis. If you ever think you can control life, you can't. Only I can. And I would, I would add, you can get more done with God in an hour than a lifetime without him. I have a little plaque in my office that reminds me of that. Do it with God not on your own strength. Or to really quote Jesus, this is what he said. Here, he gets rolling on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, about your own body, what you will wear. Is, life, is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more of value than they? And can any of you, by worrying, add a single hour to your span of life? Now, that should be a sign in your office or home. And why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet, I tell you, not even Solomon, who was a king, in all his glory, was not clothed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which is alive... Today and tomorrow's thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? Therefore, don't worry. Say, what will we eat? What will we drink? What will we wear? For it's the Gentiles, the pagans, who strive for all these things. And indeed, your heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. And then it concludes with this, but strive, seek first for the kingdom of God and his his pono, his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. And I guess you can either wait patiently 
for the Lord or you will die in despair and worry and anxiety. If you don't take your troubles to God and think you can take care of them by yourself, that will be deep kimchi. Jesus is saying, God will help you in taking care of your basic needs of food and clothing. But Jesus also says, if you strive, seek the kingdom of God, meaning strive for all of his purposes, then wait upon the Lord and all these things you always wanted and needed will be given to you in the end. And I say needed. We're not talking about fancy cars or the latest iPhone or computer games or something worldly like that. But what you really need in this world, God will provide. Okay, now we're going to come to the final point. Point three. Great is God's faithfulness. And here it all comes together in this great passage in a book about lamentations. In fact, that's the name of a book in the Bible, Lamentations. What a name. It's called that because it's a collection of poetic laments due to the destruction of Jerusalem in 586 B.C. Imagine your whole town has been destroyed and it starts off seeing the city as a despairing, weeping widow. It's a funeral dirge. And it begins with acknowledging the pain in the writer's life. And you feel the emotion. But notice, it starts changing. There's hope at the end. And in the third chapter, it says this. I remember my affliction and my wandering, the bitterness and the gall. I well remember them. And my soul is downcast within me. Yet, yet, this I call to mind. And therefore, I have hope. Because of the Lord's great love, we are not consumed, for His compassions never fail. They are new every morning. As we sang, great is your faithfulness. I say to myself, the Lord is my portion, therefore, here it comes, I will wait for Him. The Lord is good to those who hope, whose hope is in Him. To the one who seeks Him, it is good, here it comes, to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Incredible despair, but yet hope starts leaking in, then flowing in, then pouring in. How can this be? Remember the song we sing often, that hymn, great is thy faithfulness, God's faithfulness. We don't sing, great is my faithfulness, because we're not always faithful. But rather, great is your faithfulness, thy faithfulness. You, God, are dependable. You see all of the peace we can have in our life. And, and that God is faithful. He will never betray us. He will never forget us. He will never abandon us. He will never divorce us. He is faithful. He is committed to us. So much so that he died for us. He loves us so much in, that in the huge universe of heaven. He just decided to come down to this little speck called earth to live among us. That's faithfulness. And suffer with us, that's faithfulness. And help us, that's faithfulness. And rescue us and save us, that's faithfulness. And then he took a bullet for us and died on a cross for us, for us to break the virus of sin so that we might have life everlasting. That's faithfulness. And our sin to use common language, has so many variants. But God said, my death for you covers them all. Trust in me. And even though you might have spent a while betraying me, even though you might have ignored me, even though you've looked the other way for years, I will be faithful to you. So we need to wake up. We need to wake up to God's faithfulness. 
Waiting for the Lord is not necessarily another activity. It means to just rest in the presence of the Lord, receive His love in His presence, wait in His presence. Part of when we worship together in person, we can just feel the presence of God here. And I know some of you can feel it at home, but when we're together as a community, the presence of God is even more powerful. You know, Pastor Tony Evans says, another concept of the word wait um, in Hebrew is uh, plaiting your hair. Um, not a word we use often, but plaiting is like when a woman braids her hair tightly as opposed to having your hair straight and kind of blowing in the wind. So when we wrap ourselves, to use the metaphor, in and around God, being braided, in a sense, into his being, holding tight, not blowing in the circumstances of the wind, his faithfulness will give us stability in an unstable world. And we need to be tightly wound around the Lord. And we know that his commitment of love to us is braided into our soul. So think about this. Even when our faith is shaky and we sin and ignore him, God is faithful. He's committed to us. He wants to help us. But we need to let him in our lives. He's knocking at the doors of our hearts right now saying, let me in. In Lamentations 3, it says, the Lord is good to those who help, whose hope is in him, to the one who seeks him. It is good to wait quietly for the salvation of the Lord. Or in conclusion, or as the Apostle Paul wrote in the Bible, as one who experienced the love and forgiveness from Jesus after killing Christians and persecuting his church, he wrote, do you remember this in Romans 8? I am convinced that neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor, nor any powers, nor any height nor depth, not anything in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen? Amen. So receive this blessing, you online as well as here in person. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May his face shine upon you and its countenance be upon you. And may you know deep in your heart that great is God's faithfulness. And may you serve others in that truth. And may you know the full love of God the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Those of you in person, please take a seat. For those of you online, great to have you with us. Hope you join us next week. So aloha, mahalo, ahuiho. We'll see you later.